generally games, you can never IP or, or trademark or sort of register game mechanics ever. Okay, so take one of the most popular games in the world, Monopoly. The name is trademark, yeah. but the game mechanic itself is not yeah, trademark, right? True. And that goes for the games that we play, like Tarnib or, you know, those kind of games. And those are not, uh, you can't IP, so anyone can make them. We understand that it's a free-for-all in the gaming industry. And people will shamelessly copy any new features you've done. So if you ask me what's our edge, and I would say this, and it very much what I'm investing in is the culture of the team, okay? That's it. Building a culture within the team that can react and can innovate, I think that's your, your competitive advantage. That's actually what I spend most of my time doing. Welcome to Howdy Arabia. My guest this episode is Mohammed Haj Hassan from my hometown of Amman. He's an entrepreneur and a Stanford and MIT graduate. You may know him as the co-founder of Akhtabut, but since his return to Jordan from California, he has focused on his latest company, Jawakar, a network gaming platform that has grown to a 50-person operation. We talk about the difference in mindset and culture between America and the Middle East, and what it takes to run such an online business. Enjoy. This episode is sponsored by Mlabbas, your print-on-demand t-shirt service, where you can now order dozens of other gifts and accessories online by visiting www.mlabbas.com. That's M-L-A-B-B-A-S dot com. Thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. Um, welcome to Saudi Arabia. Uh, no, I love it. Thanks. I'm excited. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, awesome. Uh, <laughs> And you and I have known each other. We weren't friends, but we've we've always uh, we were one year apart in high school, and uh, we both went to the U.S. Yeah. for undergrad. Yeah. <laughs> and we're both uh, we both grew up in the same town, same right. neighborhood, probably. Yeah, Amman, you know, West Amman is pretty small. And uh, you went back to the U.S. So I did. Actually, I'll give you like just a little bit more of a background, which not a lot of people know about me. So my dad went to the U.S in the 1950s, like deep south, Georgia. He went to school there in the 1950s. Uh, the stuff that he told me that he saw then like would like shock you just to know what the US was like in the 1950s. And I have three of my uncles because like, as was the case with people back then, one person would go, like my uncle was actually the first one to go. And then my father and like a bunch of uncles followed. And for some reason, like a bunch of them settled in uh, Tennessee and okay. married women from Tennessee. So I have three aunts who are from Tennessee. From the South. From the South. And then they eventually like <laughs> kind of bought a um, like apartment complex in Knoxville, Tennessee. And I used to go every summer to Knoxville, Tennessee, <laughs> since I could remember. Wow. And we used to go Amman, Amsterdam, Amsterdam, New York, New York, Atlanta, Atlanta, Knoxville. That was how we got there. And this was like in the, the 80s. And so, like, I have this real affinity and understanding, like, for, for the U.S. Uh, and, like, when we used to go there, you know, people would ask us, oh, you guys, where are you from? Like, you look for me, like, you're from out of town. And we're like, we're, we're from Jordan. And the reaction was like, oh, my God, why did you come all the way from Georgia? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah, that was for it. Like, why would someone from Georgia come? And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm not even going to correct them. Like, if I told them where we really came from, like, oh they would be God. shocked. Man, that's insane. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. you do have some kind of like a deep uh, knowledge of the culture in the U.S. Big time. Yeah. Like and it was thought it was a positive. Uh, oh you know, my it was god! Always a positive experience going super there. Super positive. Right. Super positive. That's no, amazing. No, big fan of American culture. I've kind of, I feel like I I grew up on American TV. We used to like at that point before, obviously your Netflix and your streaming, we'd like get a, a suitcase of tapes. We just like record cable television to watch back home. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, that was that was like kind of our, uh, like my childhood was very influenced by America. And you used to go in the summers, I would assume. Before, in the summers, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the back to school shopping would be done there. You'd get the cool uh, pencil case, oh, the cool yeah, yeah. backpack from, oh, from Tennessee. Toys R Us, which is now bankrupt, <laughs> but it was my favorite place in the world. And the commercials, man, right? Like this idea of like you'd yeah. watch these commercials and like you can go to the store and you'd see the products it was like insane for a kid that's amazing that you got to see that growing up yeah my wife had that experience she grew up in Jeddah till 
till age uh, probably 13. Mm. But she got to do that every summer. So she really soaked it up. But then yeah. she moved there permanently. So so she really became like part of the culture. Yeah. So Anna, for me, it was at 18. It at was 18, my first yeah, time. Was first, yeah. My first time across the pond at 18. Wow. Uh, oh. It was a rapid uh, absorption, though, for me. I feel like compared to my peers who also went to the U.S. for the first time, after high school, yeah, yeah. I, I totally assimilated and uh, absorbed the culture. It was New York City for me, so it was kind of not the U.S. that you've been seeing every summer. Yeah. Uh, but Inta, Muhammad, you ended up in Boston at MIT. So, yeah, so that's, yeah, 99. And, uh, I went, uh, I that's went to amazing. Yeah, and Inta, yeah. you're honestly, I know when we set up this interview, it was based on, we were going to discuss the crazy... Uh, the craziness of America, right. the awesomeness of America, yeah. um, the crazy times we're in, <laughs> observations about uh, culture, economy, whatever. Uh, but also, يعني, you're one of those unique success stories at such a young age. Uh, you've co-founded two MENA region companies, online companies, platforms, Akhtabut and Jawakir. While one while you are still at the other, which is amazing, you've always been at the top of your game, even in school. Like you're, you were valedictorian at our high school, correct? Right, right. So it's not like you kind of woke up in your thirties, like, oh man, I'm gonna do something awesome. You've been like Akhtabuta. You were in your early twenties when you started forming that concept. Yeah, it's amazing that you guys, you and your co-founder, uh, was it Yusuf at the time? Yusuf, yeah. Yeah, you guys, early in your lives, you went through it, building an amazing company with investors, even during the uh, financial crisis that you were trying to get support for it. Right. So you have experience in hard economic times. Looking back now in your 20s at Akhtabut and that whole journey. Yeah. Um, so Akhtabut was founded in 2007 and it kind of like took us a year to build. So it kind of launched in 2008 smack in the middle of you know the start of the the financial crisis you're right so and and, and that did um, affect us because we we're going through the traditional route of you know angel funding uh you know or, or or sort of like friends and family angel then like so you're more like series a like that that kind of funding and this is way back when this wasn't the thing right like completely like there really weren't any of the support mechanisms that you have right now before all of this like sort of tech hype was was popular and it takes me back, but like one of the stupidest yet smartest things, I guess, in retrospect that we did is we kind of thought that, you know, a tech company, like you'd build a, a building, for example, right? We built Akhtabut. Wow, there, it's online. Great. It's like a building, it's out there. Now you just need to go like rent it out. Yeah, the company's there now, like some business person can go operate it. And what I love to do was the building part of it. Mm. So I went to my partner, I'm like, all right, you know, we just finished. Let's build another company. And actually, Jawakir, which was our second company, which is in, in gaming, was built in, in 2009. So within a year, we built the second company. And then we realized real quickly, you know, this model of just like building companies just doesn't work because you need to maintain, grow, add features. We are figuring this out as, as we went along. So again, I was stupid, yet you know, it actually did create kind of two, you know, solid, successful companies that now I run one and my partner runs the other one. So I'm happy about that decision, but it was just like in retrospect, one of the silly things you do when you're ignorant, right? Huh. You thought in the, you would hand it over to executives. Oh yeah. And I would build the third and the fourth and the fifth, huh. because I was, I've always been, and still am where I shine, where I kind of like really enjoy myself is in that highly like uber creative mode. Like I like to build things or do things that like haven't been done before. I enjoy that. I enjoy the the hypothesis and the experiment of that. Mm. It's uh, especially in the field that we're in with the Jawakar, that's very much the attitude that we take. Yeah. Like we try things that haven't been tried before and it excites us. Whether they fail or, or succeed is irrelevant, but like mm -hmm. the learning that like raw, uh, you know, primary, data that you can get from just doing something that no one else has done mm. before that's like super exciting and it motivates the team a lot you know there's just like this feeling of pride when they've done something that no one has done before and then you know we've been copied multiple times and you know the lead is the best form, form of flattery <laughs> uh so yeah and it's 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 always been for me the something that was very inspiring for me is then like my second stint in the u.s where i was much more mature i realized that what's missing in our part of the world and what's there, right? And it was a completely different uh, set of 
conclusions than my assumptions before mm. I went there. Okay. And one thing that I found was missing. It's that inspirational vibe that you have, right? That that idea that when you do something in the US, the assumption is always that you can do it. Yeah, like mm. it's it's always there is a a trust before skepticism attitude mm. if you will, right? Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, and yeah. and you feel that. It's like that's what so you say oh i want to build the biggest company doing you know xyz yeah, yeah. yeah. all right great like yeah. I, I think you can like you know prove you have to just show me that you can't do it but my first assumption is like i trust you can do it the middle east doesn't have that the middle east across the sort of the gamut of of like the workforce it's always skepticism for before trust yeah. it's always you have to prove to me even as an employee like you know i don't trust that you are a responsible person and therefore, you know, punch in, punch out, show me that. And then with time, maybe I'll give mm. you that sort of trust. So it's not the talent pool. It's not the education. It's not the exposure. It's not the actual ability to write great code or whatever it is. Yeah. It's that trust before skepticism that can unlock just a completely different yeah. uh, uh, mentality. That's for me what's missing. Okay. So um, that mindset and almost like culture. Uh, it's very different. Completely. And completely. It, it's something innate in, like you were in Silicon Valley after a long stint at Akhtabut. Is that something that you can recreate in a microcosm inside your organization? Basically, that's what you've done. That, and that's what, exactly, that's what we're trying to do is to create that. And we're growing, so we're interviewing and we're we're hiring a lot of people and most of them are fresh grads. Mm -hmm. And I always sit with everyone before like that final interview, for that final kind of like test, that cultural, like is this person going to fit in and everything. Yeah. And I always have that cultural talk. It's like, listen, you have to prove to me that you're not worthy of my trust. I trust you. That's the thing, right? And this is our culture. Like, yeah. don't even give me the... I don't want, you know, you're not, you, you graduated from school, right? You're an adult now and you don't need to give me a sick note if you're taking a sick day, right? Like I trust you and I trust you're going to do your work. And that's just mind blowing, I think, to a lot of people just because they weren't faced with that. Yeah. And more often than not, people, when given that sort of latitude and that space and me making them understand that you're responsible now, that there's personal responsibility mm -hmm. involved here, people react in a positive way. And I think it's a little bit stems from our patriarchal culture that we have in the Middle East. Like we have government taking care of you or parents taking care of their children. You don't have that space for personal responsibility. People don't feel it and people don't sort of rise to the occasion. Yeah, Very deeply cultural. But I feel that humans do react positively to that wherever they are. And mm -hmm. I think that's, for me, like the biggest realization of the difference between the U.S. and the Arab world in, in, in general is that there is a, an actual like fear from employers, from governments, from parents even, to give people that latitude to see, like, listen, you know, you're responsible for yourself, right? And I trust you to do what's right and, you know, rise to the occasion. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I know. I agree. The mindset of trusting here you're you're creating it in your organization uh, because you have to because it is a very beneficial thing but in the US it is a culture yeah like even in taxes let's say institutionally in Jordan when i arrived i had this mentality of benefit of the doubt my employees definitely if you tell me i need to work from home i believe you yeah right, right. i'm not going to take the road of a disciplinarian uh, yeah. you know because i do believe in my team if, uh, institutionally in Jordan, it starts probably from the institution where the institutions don't believe in the honesty of people in general. And I discovered that when I started dealing with the tax code and the tax authorities in Jordan, you realize, wow, your honesty is looked at with suspicion as a starting point. Right. And uh, maybe from your point of view, because your businesses have been primarily online platforms, you're not dealing with physical goods, which is you know a good thing for the most part. Uh, in my business, because we deal with a lot of physical end product. Wow, yes, that mindset hits you harder. Right. Because you're dealing with institutions that don't want to trust you and they don't trust you even if you're doing the right thing. That's not their MO. But it's great that you're able to do that internally, you know? I mean, trying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, of course, Yanni, there's still rules. There's still uh, an HR handbook, Yanni. Of course. You know? <laughs> no, no. But I mean, that's the direction. You know, I always remember one of my first experiences at MIT and like how I was like slapped in the face one of my first classes on options and, and stocks and all of that. So it was like a, a finance class. And 
At the end of the term, the professor hands out the take-home. Uh, there was a take-home final. But he says something, he's like, listen, this is a take-home final, and please remember, it's closed book. And he gives it out on a Friday, and he's like, you have to submit it on a Monday. And, you know, I sort of like did kind of like a mental double take. I'm like, <laughs> did I hear him wrong? So I go to him like after class. I'm like, so you said this is a take-home final that's closed book, right? He's like, yeah. I'm like, you know, that doesn't even flinch. And so I'm like, how do you know if I'm going to open like my book or not? He looks at me as if like I'm an alien. He's like, the honor code. Okay. <laughs> and I'm like, all right. Okay. I mean, I've been a good student. I've never cheated. Like I completely believe like if you cheat, you cheat yourself, all of that. But like, I don't believe like, you know, humans are going to do that. Yes. Right? And you have your competitive streak will right. kick in and, and think, what if the others are? Exactly. You know, exactly. what if I'm left out, the, <laughs> exactly. you know, the nice guy losing. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, fine. Like, you know, let me play ball. Right. So I studied and I Closed the book and I did the test and I adhered to the honor code and I got a I got a good grade. I did study the material, but then he like shows us our grades and shows us a curve. There was a curve, like there was an average. There were people who were outstanding and there were people who failed. Damn. Okay, so I'm like, you know something? Those people who failed deserve some for, yeah. sort of medal, right? It's amazing. So. <laughs> Imagine, imagine doing that. Like, you know, you know, Jordan, like, you know, that. imagine doing that in Jordan. Like, no even, way. you know, you do look at the idiot. Absolutely. I spoke to some people who graduated from the best engineering faculties at Jordan University in the 90s. And they were lamenting that in the 2000s, there's research paper writing shops. The photocopy centers on the University of Jordan Road have also added on a service, oh, which is okay, research right. paper writing. Amazing. Where you pay them to write your, your bath, basically. So they've your upgraded paper. their for, services. For that, so that's the extent of it's dishonest academia. Yeah, yeah, it's just yeah. rubber stamping. I don't want to go into how sad <laughs> that is. But at the end of the day, I've realized most people, if given the chance to be put in an environment mm. that is you know, people in the U.S. take for granted, right? And they think that that's, that's normal. They react in a very, very positive way. And I just mm. feel like our part of the world needs that sort of mentality yeah. on a larger scale because you have a lot of young people, okay? They still haven't had the chance to experience and become a little bit like like bitten and bitter by like the, like you were saying, like the process of like goods and dealing with different things. Like, because at some point when you get to a certain age, you start thinking, you know, whatever it is, what it is, like, what can you do about it? But when you're young and we have a, a lot of young people here, they're still wide eyed yeah. and eager. And I feel they deserve that sort of environment or a taste of an environment that I was privileged enough to be exposed to. Yeah, It changes the way a person sort of produces the productivity and the growth of a person changes if you come to them with that simple attitude i yes. trust you right that's more than any disciplinarian can do it, it sort of just creates this thing of like they don't want to disappoint or let you down and i think they're just generally more happy and comfortable working in that environment because yeah. that's the environment that i want to work in exactly yeah. yeah yeah trust does breed productivity and, and a great mindset overall definitely yeah yeah and i wanted to actually move on to something uh the revenue structure for online platforms. Okay. What I see is there's the Facebook model, which doesn't ask for your money. Just keep using our platform as much as possible. Okay. And then there's a the Netflix model, which is like, yes, keep using our platform, but all we want is your 10 bucks a month. Okay. Uh, we're not we're not selling your data as much. You know, we're not really doing that kind of thing. Hala Inta with Akhtabut and Jawakir, they're online platforms. How do they differ in terms of revenue structure? How have they evolved actually in the last 10 years? I'll give you on one side in terms of the revenue uh, model of Khtabot, which actually evolved into more, our, our business is more in HR software than it is in actual recruitment. The models in general, your standard like recruitment side, you're in the business of selling data. That's actually what you do. Like I want your CV and I will sell the data mm -hmm. to companies so that they find a job. So I think that's not as again, you know, quote unquote, ethical or unethical. I don't want to make that sort of call as someone like Facebook who might sell your data for other reasons. But at the end of the day, Akhtabut is in the business of selling data to companies. True. In a vanilla sense, it's not a derivative data sense. No, when it's when not. You're a, doing, it's, when you're doing CVs and names. Yeah, and, yeah. It's uh, exactly. It's a it's, very... It's raw lead data. Almost. Absolutely. Yeah. It's absolutely. not behavioral. It's not behavioral data. Yeah, like absolutely. Facebook. Yeah. Absolutely. It's not behavioral data. Um, the, the sort of the, what 
Akhtabut has evolved to, which is a product called Zen HR, is actually in a, is a software as a service. And I generally like that business because software as a service or like SaaS is, is effectively the newer generation of the Microsoft model. You're actually selling software and you pay for that software. So there is no data that gets mined. Now, that thing is, is a lot of companies, you mentioned Netflix, do pay you a subscription model for use of content or some SaaS companies um, charge you for the use of that software. A lot of them don't have guidelines on what they do with the data. Mm. I think it's their prerogative whether they use it or don't use it. So I don't want people to be tricked because, you know, corporates are greedy, right? They might want their cake and eat it too. So they might sell you you know, your Netflix type model or your SaaS type model might sell you the, uh, you know, sort of the subscription, but they're also doing something with your data. The question is, are they doing something with your data internally or are they selling that data? And mm -hmm. I would say pretty much every single tech company is doing something with the data. The, the people who are charging you are probably doing it internally to either make the product better or to figure out how to charge you more for different things. That's kind of the model. And again, I don't want to make a judgment call on the ethics of that because at the end of the day, how is that any different from someone who is running a factory and observing operations and gathering data on like how to improve that product line, right? So for example, like uh, at Zen HR, which is software, the revenue model is subscription-based per user, absolutely. Purely, exactly. Yeah, okay. And and there's no sort of like, because some software companies have a hidden trick is like, oh, you know, there's a free version and, and it's kind of, then it kind of goes into that Facebook uh, model where like, if you're not paying for the product, you are the product kind yeah. of thing. But, but then at the end of the day, I think it's customer awareness, right? At the end of the day, I'm on two ends of the spectrum sometimes here. On one end, like a service like Facebook or Instagram, which is an awesome service, very well built and is accessible to everyone because it's free. The people are paying for it in terms of their privacy. On the other end of the spectrum, if you say that that's paid, right, then it sort of also says if you cannot afford to pay money, you basically don't get access to that amazing content. So where do you sit, right? Like, mm. where do you sit on that so spectrum? So it's democratizing the usage by saying everybody has behavioral patterns and that's worth something. So here you go. Here's a free service. Everybody can use exactly. it. Exactly. There, there is a democratization of access to these products by making them free, right? Mm. The unfortunate thing is there aren't any laws or guidelines or clear laws of how to, because you can't blame corporates. You can't blame the Facebooks for acting the way they act, right? They're going to do what's in the interest of their employees and, and shareholders. shareholders. Yeah. Unfortunately, lawmakers, especially in the U.S., are of a certain age group where they don't even understand the nuances of this kind of stuff. If you've seen the trials. Where the hearings included Mark Zuckerberg's exactly. testimony. Right. When, he, uh, when one senator asked him, how can you make money when Facebook is free? And yeah. obviously some people understand a little bit more, yeah. but the age group and this ability to understand the nuances of these businesses, yes. and they are very nuanced, right? Like yeah. very nuanced. And, and even the people who understand them a lot are on both sides of yes, the spectrum. Yes, you need lawyers to really dig in deep and, and to, if it's not even tested in the courts, let alone the fact that it's nuanced and uh, and lawmakers are, are playing catch up because yeah. they don't understand the technology and they're bombarded by lobbyists. Absolutely. Whether it's from Silicon Valley or for, from the insurance, end of, for finance, every, every sector almost has its own pressure right. to maximize shareholder values. That's... Uh, in California, I mentioned this to you last month when I bumped into you. There are playing catch up, like I said, the mm -hmm. lawmakers. There's a there's a new privacy law yeah. that's in California and a few other states that I'm waiting to hear more about because it was only mentioned on Andrew Yang's podcast, which is a data dividend project. Uh -huh. It's a project that started on the back of this new privacy law, which aims to restrict the free for all data usage of your behavior on yeah. Facebook, for example. So that's something I'm really excited about. And the concept is funny. The data dividend project is basically aiming to allow you as a casual Facebook user to charge Facebook if they want to continue ah. their current usage of your behavioral data and right. sell it and, and mine right. it and use it to sell ads. If, uh, obviously, you will only get a few. That's the question. How much will you get for your for that data. Yeah. Facebook promises not to use any of your behavioral data. How much is that worth to Facebook? And they're coming up with numbers these days, apparently. It depends on your usage, and it's it's a fascinating area. Yeah. Um, but I want to jump 
from that to Jawakar, because I don't know what that business model is like, except for the fact that I see display ads. Is that the, the main revenue model? No. So gaming is a little bit different. So you do want, especially if it's network games, which Jawakar is, because there is a value to you as a user to the network, even if you don't pay because so ja- other people. So Jawakar is a network gaming platform? Yeah, okay. yeah. As opposed to like an individual, like just a one-on-one or what's I, the other kind of gaming platform that I mean, are out there? Or have they all evolved to become well, network I mean, uh, generally a network game is a, a game where you play with other human players online. I mean, think about a game of cards. If I had Jawaka where we'd only play with like computers or AI and you'd have that sort of experience, you wouldn't get the value from other players joining because everyone's kind of playing in their silo. Mm. But at the network game, you need three other human players to play with you. There's a social value to it. Like, you know, there's another person, you meet them, they, you like the way they play, you play another game with them. So network mm. games have an, an inherent value in in having more people there. There's a greater social dividend that gets paid effectively to other users with more users who join. Ah, so the user can build their own network and become somebody that's more known based on their skills. Absolutely. And their, yeah. their username becomes, you know, Absolutely. It's, not, it's not a blind uh, platform. No, no, no. It's completely it's... based on, oh, this guy is a master at this game and I want to play with him. Or... Very much so. Yeah, okay. yeah. You know, the very, mu- very much of the value of the people who pay is a derivative of other people who don't pay. You basically have a very, very, very small percentage of those who actually pay. Right, so mm. I would say ninety nine percent plus of Joaquin players have never paid a dime, and that's fine, right? So that one percent still gives value to the company, mm-hmm. and obviously we do use data to actually see when we can get or how we can convert more users. So that's definitely part of our business. Or mobile network games are a little bit different; mm-hmm. they actually um, don't use your data at all for advertising. So So they use it for retention and for onboarding new subscribers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Internally. Yeah. Okay. Great. I mean we barely make any money if like like literally like pretty much negligible amount of our revenue comes from advertising. The way we deal with our data is completely the way I explained like the sort of the you know optimizing the the product line sort of thing. We use it a lot to Mm -hmm. make the product better. Non-paying users, which are the majority, of course. Uh, they get bombarded though with ads, or not really? No, I mean we do have. It's not like we don't have ads. We do run like third-party ad platforms, mm-hmm. but they are insignificant. If I turn them off today, it wouldn't matter. Huh. So, are they almost used sometimes? I feel like with my kids playing a lot of free games on the iOS or Android, that some of the ads are disruptive enough to kind of push you to get the ad-free paid version. That, that is a model. Again, this is Joaka, right? It's not all games are like that. Yeah. There are games that are actually completely ad-driven, mm-hmm. okay? And there are games that make the experience, the ad-driven uh, experience annoying so that you pay. But we're in a sort of a, a segment of gaming, which you call free-to-play or FTP games, which are driven by converting users to pay. I see. Right? Like, I do want you to pay for the value that you get from Jawaka. Uh-huh. Most of that value is socially driven. The stuff that we actually make money from is the table. You can go and you can play on a table that looks unique and different. Mm-hmm. But that value is a derivative of other people seeing that table, if you know what I mean. Yes. There is that, that element. So the bigger the community, the bigger the value of these. Yes. Uh, it's these similar products. to how Fortnite uh, sells uh, skins. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Exactly. It's not a, it's not a new game. Uh, it's an experience. It's a slightly different experience and a, and a, and a socially a visible kind of I, look. That's exactly it. That's okay. exactly it. And Fortnite skins is is the model there. And a lot of people to say like, why would someone do that, right? Mm-hmm. But parallel to that is why would someone buy a ticket to to go see a movie at the cinema, right? Now probably not as much many people do that now. <laughs> but the idea is like you're paying for entertainment value. There yeah. is entertainment value. Who's yeah. to say like 10, 15, whatever, 20 bucks for a movie ticket and you know is is worth something. Whereas like, you know, a dollar for like a you know a unique table where like while I'm playing this game, I just like I've I've extracted entertainment value out of it. Who's to say that that's not worth the same, if not more, to different people? Yeah. So yeah, that's the that's Jawakar and in a sort of in a nutshell. Okay. And you guys are 
uh, you look at competition in the Middle East, let's say, from other platforms that have popped up since you guys came along, do you look at them as something that you need to be looking at them closely to, to make sure they don't take market share or there's their IP on the certain games? Because I know a lot of the games are traditional old games that aren't really protected right, maybe right. By, by copyright, at least. Exactly. Probably there isn't a patent on how to play a certain game. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe there no, is. No, you're absolutely So right. they're unprotected kind of IP that it depends on how awesome you guys make the experiences. And is that really the competitive edge in the region? And Look, uh, you're absolutely right. Generally, games, you can never IP or, or trademark or sort of register game mechanics ever, okay? So take one of the most popular games in the world, Monopoly. I can take Monopoly call it whatever I want and have that board game. As long as you avoid the trademark. Look. I can't use it. I can't yeah. use that guy. All the know, likeness the, of the all likeness. the trademarks. Like that guy, the name probably is, yeah. is trademarked. Yeah, absolutely. But the game mechanic itself is not yeah, trademarked, right? True. And that goes for the games that we play, like Tarnib or, you know, the bridge, similar, you know, those kind of games. So we have those card games and those are not, uh, you can't IP. So anyone can can make them, right? So we understand that like, yeah, it's a free for all in the gaming industry and people will shamelessly copy any new features you've done. So if you ask me what's our edge, and I would say this, and it very much what I'm investing in is the culture of the team. Okay. That's it. That's you know, probably not the answer that you were expecting, mm. but like building a culture within the team that can react and can innovate and can kind of grow. I think that's your your competitive advantage. That's actually what I spend most of my time doing, like making sure we have an awesome culture inside the team because I'm not going to be the one innovating. It's the team that's going to be innovating. I mean, we have a you know, a Joaka, like almost a 50 person operation and making sure that the culture is a culture that like can push forward whenever, you know, we need to react to competitors. That's, I think, where your long-term advantage is. I see. Yeah. And and they're all based in Amman, correct? Yes. Awesome, most. Awesome. No, we have it, we have uh, Amman and Abu Dhabi, but yeah, most of it is in Amman. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Like the kitchen, the actual like operations is in Amman. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. We mentioned Fortnite earlier made me think of the cut that app stores take. Yeah. But you guys, uh, you don't go through that, right? Does the Apple store make a cut from oh, yeah, yeah, subscriber? Of, course, of one of, of your subscribers? Um, okay. Look, the app stores, I'll, I'll tell you my sort of quick thing about this because I have beef with Apple. I don't have beef with Google. And I'll okay. just give you the subtleties of this, okay? <laughs> the first thing is um, they take a 30% cut. Yeah, Apple okay? does. Apple does and Google does. And Google does. Okay, yeah. so from every dollar that a user pays me, 30 cents go to the app stores, yeah. okay? Otherwise, you won't be able to list on there if you make it an outside transaction. That's the that's what happened with Fortnite. That's the important thing, okay? Yeah. So Google's platform, the Android platform, mm -hmm. okay? They have an application on that called the Google Play Store. It's a store that they've built, they've invested in. They actually have unbelievable support. I'll you know give them that. They're like superb, superb, superb product where they're like, this is the store, list your app on the store, and I'm going to take a 30% cut. If you don't like that, list your app on any other store on, uh, the, on, Google the, platform. on the Android platform. You can go and I can go in right now, me and you, if I think 30% is too much, we'll open another store, you know, call it Imad and Mo's mm. game store, and we'll start marketing to gaming companies. We'll say, listen, you know, come to us. We're only going to take 15%, yeah. you know, all of that. And it has happened. Huawei has, a, it's called App Gallery, has a store on Android devices yes. that let's just say subpar, right? Yeah. Relative to Google. And they take less, yeah, less obviously percentage. They can't, yeah. Now that's for Google. So Google taking 30%, is that a lot? Is that a little? At the end of the day, it's a free market. Like open another store, see if you can make it for less than that. Yeah. I personally think yeah. Google's service is unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. They're awesome. They share data with yeah. you. They treat you like a partner and all of that. That's Google. Take Apple which I think what's happening on Apple, and that's why you see the fight with, with between Epic, Epic and all of yeah. that is on Apple, because Apple has a closed system. The question is, as a developer, you cannot publish a game or any app unless you go through the App Store and you are not allowed to have a competing App Store. That's the big thing. So today, that's where I think the argument for it being a monopoly is much stronger than someone from Google. And to add on that, Apple's service, I'm telling you, is terrible yeah. when it comes to like servicing their clients. They don't treat you like a partner, which you are. 
you are a partner. Like Google calls you a partner. He's taking 30% of your top line. Yeah. He is a partner, but he treats you like a partner. So the Google ecosystem does treat you like a partner. Apple treats you as if it's a privilege for you to be on that store. That's what frustrates a lot of the developers is like, you know, when you ask for data, like certain things happen, you don't get that feedback from Apple. Google, every company that reaches a certain like level has a dedicated representative that works for you. And like the guy who works for with us is awesome. Like I send him an email today, like five minutes later, he's like putting us in contact. They have that infrastructure in place. So your 30%, is actually going some like it's costing them money to run something. Yeah, yeah, right? that's amazing. The Apple engine is, I think, taking advantage of the fact that you have no other choice. Do you see yeah. what I'm trying to say? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's and, like yeah, Apple is is banking on the elitist kind of buffer that they've built. Maybe that's because they they are surviving. They are they are pretty big. You yeah. have to list on them. It's not they're in the market. Yes, and uh, I don't know. Is it like a nightclub that has a bouncer that doesn't allow? Most people in, or it does, but then inside there's almost nothing uh, of service. It's just, how can they afford to still, is it, or is it a matter of time where they just have to open up or lose a big no, chunk of the market? No, I mean, Apple's arguments is like, we're not even one of the top globally. I don't think they're like the top sale. Like most people have Android devices, yeah, right? That's true. But if you look at your the revenue, you get the people who have Apple devices yeah. actually compared to the people who have Android devices. Revenue-wise, they're neck and neck. The more affluent audiences in Apple. So from, yeah, a pure market share, like percentage of phones sold, they're not that significant relative to like your Samsungs and your Huawei. Yeah, because it's a whole that. slew of hardware exactly. that's, that runs Android. So you can't compete with the numbers there. By the way, are you on Huawei's app gallery? I am. I am. You have to be. I am. And your your I revenue. I have to be. But I mean, you have because the Middle East has a good Huawei usage as a hardware. As a hardware. So you have to be to not to lose those audiences. But it's not. It's not worth it. You, but you, get, I mean? you do get a better cut from Huawei's store, though. But even though I don't get anywhere close to the same service, like my tech team is super frustrated whenever we have to upgrade like our app on Huawei. Yeah, because there's no documentation, there's uh, no help, there's no. But that then goes to show you why Google is playing fair. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Google, are they overcharging by thirty percent? It's a free market. Yeah. If yeah. they are, then other people are going to come yeah, in yeah, and start yeah. eating their lunch. Yeah. The thing with Apple is that it's not a free market because Huawei or whoever it is cannot come in with yeah. another app store that you can download from, mm. and that's where I think it makes it a little bit unfair. I agree. The fact that Google kept things relatively open, it's more justified. And yeah. the service is better, so you can't exactly. compare. Yeah. Whether you can define it as a real free market, uh, you know, there's only two players. And if Google drops to 20%, it's not going to move the needle on how many people are, are on Apple. That's, yeah. the, that's what makes me think it's not a true free market. Because if free, free markets, usually if you play with the price, there's elasticity where you can take more clients in that are using the same service. But who is the client anyway? You're as an app developer, you make money from your app, right. which is listed on the Play Store. I'm as a user, uh, I pay both of you guys. If Google drops to 20% cut, you can choose to give me that yes. premium, which I think Epic Games has done to flaunt the whole thing. Yeah, uh, My son's telling me that, oh, skins are cheaper now on PC. You can just buy them. Right. Uh, because they don't have to pay the, they're just their own merchant now. Yeah. On yeah. PC, at least. Do you have PC subscribers? You, PC you do. In, you do. In Joaquin, I oh, mean. of course, of course. There are PC I, jo uh, subscribers. Yes, yes, yes. Can they then open their iPhone and play now? Of course they can. But that's uh, the subtlety of the argument. So what Epic did, which was arguably wrong and illegal, but they just wanted yeah. to push Apple's button. Yeah. So Google and Apple don't tell you that you can't have a web application and you can't use like any other form of payment. It doesn't even tell you whether you can charge cheaper prices for that. I can go in and say, I'm going to charge 30% cheaper for my products on the web than I would the, in on the Google. Store, like yeah. you, can, you can do that, right? Um, but the thing is, you cannot promote that inside the app, which is fair. Like I have, uh, I mean, I'm Google or I'm Apple. I have my own payment platform. You can't say buy from the web and I redirect you and then you're going to get 30% cheaper, they're going to come and tell you what the hell, like that's against my, our, our policies. And that's that's fair, like you can't yeah, do that yeah. because they do get that cut and they're like, yeah. I'm getting that 30% for a, yeah, a yeah. bunch of things. And the so price, that's the argument. Yeah, it is, yeah. yeah. And the price that uh, someone who wants to do that has to pay is a poor user experience. I remember that, for example, if you use Audible, 
mm-hmm. uh, the Audible app on on iPhone. Yeah, I still think to this day you can't just do the th- finish complete getting a book on the app. Oh yeah, you yeah. actually go somewhere else. You buy credits. Yeah, and, and I I think that I'm not sure how Apple. And it's an annoying that. experience, but Amazon basically just decided that no, you know, we're not going to give Apple thirty percent anyway. You're going to have to go out. Uh, yeah. to Amazon and do the whole you know check out from there. Uh, exactly. And I'm not yeah. sure how Apple deals with that. For the longest time because I'm a big Audible user for the longest time actually you couldn't even use credits on the app. You'd have to go on Audible, buy credits, buy your book and then you can only download it on yes. your app. Yes. It becomes it pops in your library. It pops up in your, your library. You can you can even like consume a credit. So even if I had like whatever, 15 credits and I saw a book, I couldn't say buy yeah. credit. You can't uh. buy credits audible, like you still buy them on the web, um, but still you can consume them on the app. They rely on the user's yeah. awareness of figuring that out. And I think that's fair game. Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, so do you personally, are you eyeing something new since you love building concepts from scratch. What, what do you think now that we're in the middle of a pandemic? What are you eyeing? Uh... So I'll tell you what I am excited about. I don't know if I I jump into this field now just because I just have my hands full with the Joe Walker, like really full. So because obviously, it, you know, the whole COVID issue has changed the scale of how we kind of operate. For the positive, I oh, guess. Absolutely. No, growth. For the positive. Big yeah, growth. Yeah, growth. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, it's just jumped to a different scale of company. And now you kind of have to like deal with other things that you yeah. weren't, weren't dealing with. So we have our hands full with that. What I think has changed or has been changing, but has accelerated a lot in terms of people's perception is the space, the education space. There's always been something there that has been obvious to me, but I think people have realized this now. And like a lot of people don't know, like when I went to Stanford, I actually, um, I have a master's in education. I always like said like that's something I would want to do or work on uh, going forward. I look at online education and I'm a huge fan of online education. Like I post, you know, Stanford have been like a consumer of a lot of these online courses. And I see now my kids and I see a lot of people learning online and you see what is super effective in education. I think this is very exciting for countries like ours, like developing countries. This is a super exciting proposition because today access to that content is for everyone. It is completely democratized. You can today get access to the best content in the world for free or for next to nothing. So the question is, again, like I always ask myself, like what's missing? Like the question I was asking myself when I went to the States and and the Arab world, like what is missing? And for me, what is missing are certain elements that complement education that we've not really maybe undervalued because the model of a lot of people towards education, they think it's about that content, right? Mm -hmm. It's about getting the professor telling you how to solve these equations or whatever it is, right? That's a very small part of it because that's been solved by online education. You can get access to the best math professor to teach you calculus one in the world. You don't need 10,000 teachers teaching you the same subject. You can get one person. But what is missing? Two things are missing, that you need an offline uh, solution to those. One is people are not self-disciplined. Okay, school, the format of school today gives a a structure of discipline. Like you have class at 9 a.m. and it finishes at 9.50. Then you have break, then you have that. So there is that structure. And it's kind of like the PT model, right? Why do people, you know, have have a personal trainer and not go to For the discipline. Because, and that's a market that's not dying, right? Because, you know, people are generally not disciplined, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the self-discipline of it that has a little bit of, you know, that's there's a social kind of peer pressure along with it, not just, you know, the school. And there's this idea of like, you have other people doing it at the same time. So you have that, like the self-discipline that comes from teachers. From the offline protocols that come with being at school. Exactly. Uh, even online, by the way, when our kids show up to the Microsoft Teams screen, there's, you know, 10 of them. There are 10 kids on the screen, the teachers, she shouts at them if they turn the video off. It's like, it's early, like it's early stages of online learning. Right, yeah, but, but... Uh, that's how it looks like. And there is that, the self-discipline aspect, the offline served it really well. Exactly. Where you really have to be there, in, like the PT concept, yeah. Exactly. So you have that. 
And then there's the other element, which is the social aspect. I would challenge you to literally, so your your son is on his own, right? Doing his lesson, mm-hmm. right? Just add one of his friends who's right next to him doing the same thing. And I guarantee you, because I've seen this, the performance will just increase dramatically. Physically in the same physically space. Physically in the same space. Uh, literally on their own iPad or PC okay. or whatever it is, but just physically in that same space. Mm-hmm. To create a that social peer pressure of like, you know, if I'm like not paying attention, I see them paying attention. I'm like, no, I'm just going to pay yeah. attention. I don't want to be the, the pariah Yeah, here. no, I agree. Listen, because already I can see that on a much smaller effective scale because he sees the other kids answering on the little boxes on the yes. screen. So there's that that slight effect that is there. But obviously, like you're saying, if it's physically in the same space, participation will probably increase. But then you have the trade-off of discipline. Discipline today with corona, since teachers can't be there, there's the erosion of discipline, which is the first issue you mentioned. Yeah, but How I can mean, you solve both at the same time? I can only imagine my son's friend, if he yeah. comes over, uh, oof, there's going to be a gap in discipline. I'm with you. But fast forward, post-corona world, where you accept that an education from a content standpoint can be served online. Yes. So you don't need a teacher to teach, Right. But you do need a teacher or whatever you want to call that person to do other things. Mm -hmm. So this, for me, you're asking me like what things are exciting in this world. This, for me, is an opportunity for an educational institution of the future. Think with me, a physical space that kids come to, Mm -hmm. okay? Now, obviously, not a good business because uh, because of people who need no, to No, no, I, I, now I'm getting where you're, you're, you're now, getting. Now I'm going to say where you're getting at. In the future, when we're beyond this issue where physical contact is restricted, we've proven that online education can do so much. Right. And that the teacher themselves does not have to be the disciplinarian, old school, like from the 18th century format that we're still doing. Yes, then you have opportunities when you can use resources to build programs, better syllabus, all that kind of stuff. And And I don't need a teacher. Do you you know what I mean? Not needing a teacher in the sense of... I don't want to say I don't need a teacher. I don't need a subject matter expert. Yes. Okay? So if I want to have a school where I want to teach physics 101, right now I can go and curate a bunch of content and can give you the best physics 101 content that Mm. you can imagine. Okay? So let's say a crude application. True. That's no longer an issue. But that has not been an issue for a while, but hasn't been accepted. So it's it's not integrated into the learning experience. It's not. It's not. Not really. It's always it's always your own initiative. I can log in and and, exactly. and learn something, which hits the discipline the wall. Yeah, but <laughs> but imagine an institution whereby you yeah. have that. Uh, call them a teacher, right? But again, yeah. they're not the subject matter ex- yeah, expert. Yeah. They're administrating. They're administrating that class. Yeah, and they are taking the content, you know, as downloading mm. it. But people are in a class. Instead of watching a teacher, they're watching this True. video. For me, what's exciting about that is today, we went to great colleges abroad, primarily to get that world-class education Absolutely. that did not exist here. What I'm saying is the US and all, all of the great schools will still offer something. But what I think they don't offer anymore, you don't need to go there to get that world-class education. True. True. So can you create an institution maybe of higher learning in a country like Jordan, where I can get a Harvard education on par with a person who is attending Harvard, but having more of a local campus feel. Do you see what I mean? No, I agree. Whether that's accredited by Harvard or not is is, is maybe even irrelevant. It's exciting. It will evolve in that direction. Uh, It should be heading there because like you said, it's, um, it's it's an amazing opportunity, not because there's money to be made in this, but because you can really bring a much better level of instruction to communities that never had access to it. Absolutely. It's impact. And the thing is, it's impactful for very low cost, relatively. Do you see what I mean? Imagine I can take the masses in a country like Jordan and have them be educated at a higher level that is higher than what our educational institutions are offering today. Most of the people that we recruit in Jawakar and in Zen they're self-taught. Like they haven't learned that much at university. And I think that's both sad and an opportunity. All right, so why are you wasting your time? Like you don't have great people teaching great subject yeah. matter as yeah, experts. Yeah, yeah. Take that person out of the equation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. Yeah, man, let's have this. Have more of this again. And if you want to suggest other other cool people to have talks with, well, the platform is open. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I have a couple of people that I'm thinking of. I'll tell you about yeah, that Yeah, man, I'd love yeah. to. I'd love to. Habibi. Great. Cool. Habibi. Good having Thanks. you. Thanks.
Tsch, tsch. <lacht>